When you think of national parks, you think of wildlife. The sight of an animal roaming free is a thrill few ever forget. Wild National Parks takes a walk on the wild side through bear country. Goes one on one with a rattler. Follows the flow of the fastest moving land mammal in the Western Hemisphere. Raises a gentle giant. And gets a little too close for comfort. In the next hour, we'll find out just what it takes to nurture generation after generation. Along the Alaska Peninsula, waves crash up against a land of snow-capped mountains, pristine waters, and glacial melt. Katmai National Park spreads over hundreds of miles of rugged coastline, where whales breach, and an otter twists and turns in the sun. Overhead, a bald eagle soars, Yet Katmai is most famous for its land-loving brown bears. These awe-inspiring giants have come to symbolize a majestic place. Along the stormy bays of the Shelikov Strait, this top predator moves about undisturbed. And the bear watching is unrivaled. To get there isn't easy. There are no roads. One stepping off point is the picturesque and offbeat seaside town of Homer. Along the spit, bears are part of the local lore. From here, a float plane is the ticket to the Katmai coast. As the scenery changes, it's an incredible ride over bays and beaches and coastal rivers a spectacular backcountry that's worth all the effort to get there. Emerald Air has been bringing people and bears safely together for over 20 years. Before you ever see a bear, there are signs of them. Abundant food combined with a Katmai population of some 2,000 bears creates a phenomenon Bears here are more tolerant of each other and more tolerant of people. They've habituated, meaning they tend to ignore us as a species. One of the things that happens in a close situation like this, though, is as long as there's no reason for the bears to have uh, association to people, they pretty much view us as a tree or a rock in the landscape. A big misconception about bears is sort of the wolves and the Red Riding Hood type of effect. And then a bear will walk by and, oh, there's a bear. What do we do? And then the bear walks away and you see their mind changing in terms of, oh wow, the bear wasn't interested in us. Getting over your fear doesn't mean you can move freely through bear country. But according to bear guide Chris Day, there are ways to avoid trouble. The three mistakes that people make that get them in trouble with bears are number one, surprising a bear. The second mistake they make is moving closer to a bear. And the third mistake they make is backing up from a bear. Bears are curious. If you're watching them, they may watch you. So hold your ground. Bears are bullies. Bears love to move things. You'll see it out here with the bears. There's just something in a bear's nature that likes to make things move. So if they can get you to move, that's encouraging that bold behavior. And the more you back up, the bolder the bear gets and then you can trigger that predator-prey response, and then I think you're in trouble. The reality of being in the lair of the bear is that it's humbling. Called brown bears, they vary in color from blonde to black. With their trademark hump, brown bears are genetically the same as grizzlies. The only difference is their enormous size. At over 1,200 pounds, a large male can weigh twice as much as a grizzly. 
and they can clock in at 35 miles per hour, which is why you should never run from a bear. Spring brings bear weather, cool and rainy. After they come out of hibernation, they gather around the sedge flats. Always in survival mode, bears feast on the high protein plant life. Following its nose, a bear uses its strong claws to dig for clams. Cracking it open, it savors the treat. Up and down the Katmai coast, a network of trails forged by bears over the years leads to places called bear rugs, where scent acts as a calling card. Bears scent mark in their territory. They don't mark their territory in the sense of a dog, like marking the corner of their yard. They mark their presence in a place. All along this meadow, there are different spots like this where bears scent mark. And these trails coming into the rub, each male bear that comes along here, they'll step in the same track year after year. They've got scent glands in the bottom of their feet. So as they're walking, they'll twist their feet. And if you look into these footprints, you can actually see the grasses twisted. And then they'll walk up. They'll typically urinate here and then stand and rub. Quite often, they'll chew. You can see where they've chewed here and they've chewed over here on this wood. And then they'll walk away. If you see an adult female in May or June, chances are a male is in close proximity to the object of its infatuation. The males know their job is to breed. Using scent, they seek out a receptive mate. For the females, it's too early, so there's a whole lot of chasing going on. A female will run and move away from a male if she's not receptive. And they'll typically run a distance, stop, run a distance and stop as these males are pursuing them. Quite often, they'll allow the male to come right up and play with them and be right there with them. And if they're not receptive, they'll sit down. The larger the male, the more likely the opportunity to breed. And the big boys of Katmai strut their stuff. Many have battle scars to go along with the honor. Females are promiscuous. A litter of cubs may have more than one father. Beyond breeding, they love to play. As these powerful animals wrestle, it can look like a fight. But today, it's a peaceful exchange. In this land of the midnight sun, where daylight can exceed 20 hours, the bear watching can go on and on. The coast of Katmai National Park in Alaska isn't the only place to walk among the bears. The park covers over four million acres of glacial carved valleys, towering mountains, and crystal clear lakes. In this wild and remote spot, float planes ferry people to Brooks Camp on the shores of Lake Naknak in the interior of the park. This small developed area with a lodge, campground, and enclave of cabins is the only place to stay. It's also a jumping off point for backpackers heading out to explore the wilderness. Katmai is also a land of active volcanoes. 23 miles away, the Valley of 10,000 Smokes is a major destination. It's the site of the largest eruption of the 20th century. The 1912 blast of Novorupta left behind an enormous flow of lava. The main bulk of the sheet that we see is primarily a flow deposit. It burst into the air, perhaps 100,000 feet vertically up, at some point lost energy and fell back to earth and came roaring down the valley. 
A lookout point gives a grand overview of the scale of the flow. A series of deep gashes in the earth were formed by rushing waters after the main event. A river continues to cut through the layers of rock. Along the valley floor, you get a better perspective of the depth of the flow. The three different flows came into place um, throughout the course of the valley, stacking on top of each other, and it's about 80 feet thick here. It gets a lot thicker, um, perhaps as much as 700 feet thick around Nova Rupta Vent itself. To get closer to the vent requires a challenging trek over rugged terrain. The Valley of 10,000 Smokes is a dramatic reminder that nature is a work in progress. This area is also a well-known sports fisherman's paradise. Anglers chase rainbow trout, where it's catch and release. Only an occasional bear wanders into camp until late June and July, when anglers aren't the only fishers. No matter the season, the first stop is the park's visitor center for mandatory bear school. This is a bag here, which is a good example. It didn't have any food in it, but uh, was set down and left unattended while somebody ran up from the beach, asked a question, and by the time they got back down, a bear had gotten into their bag. Bears are curious about pretty much anything in their environment, so carry everything with you, don't set it down. Bears begin to gather along the Brooks River when the sockeye salmon begin a massive run. Hundreds of thousands of fish make a journey inland from the ocean to reproduce and spawn. Swimming upstream, they hit the falls and pile up. Fish are jumping at a time when the bears are ramping up for winter, creating one of the biggest concentrations of brown bears in the world. All told, more than 70 bears will venture here over the season. Visitors who come to the feast aren't disappointed. Bears, although we think of them as fishermen, aren't very good at catching fish. And the bears actually have a lot easier time when there's lots and lots of fish around. Most years, the salmon run is so large that there is enough. It's more a question of whether or not the bears can tolerate close enough proximity. To keep the sheer number of bears and humans apart, the Park Service built viewing platforms. Brooks Camp can get up to 350 visitors a day. You might be surprised at who else is looking on. Adult brown bears don't usually climb trees, but with so many other bears around, this tree is a safe haven for a pair of cubs while their mother is out fishing. As bears take time out to eat their catch, others stand by for an opening near the falls. There's a lot of competition among bears for space and opportunity. There is the occasional year when there aren't enough salmon, and there tends to be a major social reorganization among the bears, and we have the occasional very exciting summer when that happens. This mother bear catches a fish, but she teaches her cubs a lesson in life. She makes them work to get it away from her. With the salmon runs, bears are all over the place. There's a good chance of encountering one while fishing or hiking or just moving about. The park advises everyone to be bear aware. The bears have grown up here. The people that have been coming here, some of the same people have been seeing the same bears, you know, for year after year after year. The bears are used to people and the people are used to bears, which can be both good and bad. In this case, it's good. While bears fear each other, they're not afraid of much else. Being at Brooks Camp is an exercise in modifying your own behavior because you're not the biggest, strongest species. 
Whether the bears are feasting at the falls, digging for clams along the coast, or just being bears, the chance to observe these powerful creatures at close range is extraordinary. Katmai offers some of the best bear viewing of any national park. Amid the cliffs of central Arizona, Montezuma Castle hugs the rocky walls above a river valley. This ancient high rise is among the best preserved of the ruins found throughout the American Southwest. Each year, a half million visitors come to see how prehistoric people once lived. Yet, they aren't the only cliff dwellers. This is rattlesnake country. The rocky limestone crags and crevices below the castle are prime habitat for the western diamondback, one of the largest and deadliest reptiles in North America. That's their denning area. And in the summertime, after they come out of hibernation in spring and summer, they'll come down across this visitation area and towards the river and hang out there and then wander back. This highly successful survivor lives 20 to 25 years, so you might see it around the park. We'll have occasions where visitors will interact with the, the rattlesnakes. That's something we had to learn to handle. A decade ago, we would move those snakes to a totally different area and nickname the place Rattlesnake Canyon. In the mid-1990s, Erica Novak of the U.S. Geological Survey began studying the rattler's whereabouts. Her research showed that removing them wasn't effective. The snakes returned to the same sites. So they were homing. They were actually coming back to their original home range. The other thing that happened was that even though the rattlesnakes were returning to the monument, many of them actually died after they returned. Erica's research changed the way the park manages its rattlesnake population. Today, their health is carefully cataloged. And they're never moved more than 50 feet from their capture point. Diamond-shaped patterns, along with the black and white tail bands, make diamondbacks easy to identify. But they can be tough to spot. And they're very, very camouflaged. And that's the primary way that they defend themselves against predators, including humans. And so my theory is, based on my research, is that people have a lot of encounters with rattlesnakes, but they don't actually know it because the rattlesnake stays so still. State-of-the-art technology is used to locate a rattler and monitor movement. Inside the rattler, a small battery-powered device emits a signal that gets picked up by a receiver. The rattlers are each assigned their own channel. Today, channel 44 is due for a checkup. This rattler hibernates along the trail in front of the castle. It lies coiled up under a boulder, a typical hideout for a reptile to shade itself from the heat of the day and to keep out of sight. It takes skill to even attempt to pick up a rattler. The object is to not injure the snake and to avoid its strike. It's hard to know where you're going to put your tongs. It's hard to know when you put the tongs in there, what's going to happen. Getting a venomous viper into a bucket is a feat that will give you a rush of adrenaline. Of the 11 species of rattlers, this giant of the snake world grows up to six feet in Arizona. Size gives it a wider striking range. When handled, it senses it's under attack. The snake starts to thrash. He became very scared. But it was interesting, when I actually put him down on the ground, he relaxed a little bit. And he relaxed just, just enough that I was able to actually pick him up again quickly and stuff him into the bucket.
At a local clinic, a rattler is prepped for a transmitter replacement. Most wildlife studies attach collars, but the shape of a snake makes that impossible. Between the scales. A veterinarian opens the cavity up and replaces the radio transmitter. The thin battery-operated device will provide a steady tracking signal for the next three years. Even though the procedure is extreme, it has led to a better understanding and protection of the species. Back along the rocky outcrops of Montezuma's castle, the snake is set free in the same spot where it was originally picked up. Today, park rangers are proactive in snake management. They even learn how to handle a rattler. The way to think about it is how much pressure would you want if Godzilla picked you up? Erica will give a training a couple of times a year. Everyone gets excited about it. It's a new skill set for the employees. They love handling the snakes. In you go, Good. honey. Part of their protection comes in the form of putting an end to a bad rap. Rattlers aren't waiting to attack you, and injecting venom is always a last resort. Rattlesnakes are just another animal that you can actually encounter in the desert, and they're actually out there eating a, a lot of rodents, lizards, just doing their job. They really aren't looking for an encounter with you, but the venoms they have are extremely powerful, and there are fatalities that occur from them. So certainly people should try to avoid having contact with them and keep a safe distance. When rangers find a snake in a visitor area, it's placed in a bucket, and visitors get the chance to learn about the rattler before it's released off the trails. Do you check on their, their families? Do they have a lot of babies? Or, um, and how do you tell the male from the female? In this region, western diamondbacks can have three to five babies every other year, and length determines gender. Males have longer tails. To date, the park's approach to snake management seems to be working. Along with the ruins, the rattlers have become part of the visitor experience. Montezuma Castle is their home. Snakes live a long time. If we have a population of snakes that are used to visitors and they know they're not going to get harassed, they're going to get more comfortable and relaxed around people. Um, it's really a kind of a copacetic relationship and we want to maintain that as long as we can. The majestic Teton mountain range scrapes the big sky of Wyoming, where Grand Teton and neighboring Yellowstone National Parks make up part of what is called the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, an 18 million acre track that's one of the largest protected regions on Earth. An Eden for wildlife Grand Teton is home to 60 species of mammals and nearly 300 species of birds. In this mountainous country, seasons play a vital role. Because temperatures plummet to 20 or even 40 below zero, many of the animals migrate to survive. The weather can be cold and wintry for six months of the year. As the temperatures warm and snows begin to melt, more wildlife can be seen milling about. The National Park Service begins its annual Rite of Spring to take count of the year's newest arrivals. The best time to count the calves, of course, is right after they're born. If you'll notice the difference between the adult animals and the calves, the calves are a very bright orange color, whereas the adults are dark brown. So it's a very easy time to contrast the new calves from the adult animal. And we'll go around the distribution of bison in the park and do that throughout the summertime. Bison are made for this region. Their numbers have grown from 400 to nearly 1,000 over the past decade. We're actually concerned more about there being too many of them at this point than, than not enough, but that's a good thing. Other species, like the exotic-looking pronghorn, aren't faring as well. They're on the decline. 
This mammal, unique to North America, is often called an antelope. They're not true antelope. They, I think they got called that originally because they look like the antelope that people are familiar with in Africa. They evolved here. Um, so they're very unique. They're a, they're a treasure to Grand Teton National Park. When you spot a pronghorn standing solitary and at high alert, a fawn may be hidden nearby. Predators pose an age-old threat. A white rump acts as an alarm. As the patch rises up and bristles, the hair turns bright white to signal danger to the herd. Recent research shows the wolf, a coyote predator, may prove to be an unexpected ally in the pronghorn's long-term survival. In areas where there were wolves, coyotes were less abundant, and so fawns lived longer and survive better, which is a real attribute to why wolves can count in these ecosystem dynamics and benefit pronghorn because of their effect on coyotes. Moving with grace and agility, pronghorn can reach speeds of 60 miles an hour, making them the fastest mammals in the Western Hemisphere. Trying to follow these animals, Lewis and Clark referred to them as speed goats. Why are they so fast? We don't know, but there used to be cheetahs here. Cheetahs went extinct in this hemisphere 10,000 years ago. Cheetahs are gone and pronghorn are left speedy. While the Jackson Hole Valley vegetation is a primary food source in summer, to find adequate food in winter requires a migration of up to 400 miles round trip the longest migration in the lower 48 states. At Grand Teton, the pronghorn move out of bounds. Many of our animal populations traverse our borders regularly. The pronghorn is a good example. And so it's actually Park Service policy to kind of keep our eyes out on things that are happening outside our boundaries that may affect the important resources inside the boundaries. One of the ways that the, the National Park Service is able to participate in these kinds of things is through partnering. The National Park Service and the Wildlife Conservation Society teamed up to pinpoint the pronghorn migration corridor. This corridor is so narrow in places down to 200 yards wide that at any, several of any given points, it could be cut off simply from a fence that wouldn't allow their passage, perhaps a drill rig that disturbed that narrow corridor. And if that happened, the pronghorn would basically go extinct in Grand Teton National Park. To build on the migration study, the Wildlife Conservation Society now monitors their well-being outside the park. A team that includes wildlife biologists and a veterinarian undertake a critical winter mission to capture a live pronghorn without injury to themselves or the animal. When trailing a lightning fast species over rough terrain, there's only one way to do it, with a bird's eye view. In a fight or flight response, the pronghorn race across their winter range. Think of a school of fish, the pronghorn seem to flow together. They have great fluidity. They're moving, helicopters coming in, dropping in on top of them. A man leans out, aims, and fires. But it's no ordinary weapon. It shoots off a net. And they're weighted on each side, and they flare out, almost like a big volleyball net, a huge volleyball net. Animals running, drops, and tangles. The helicopter lands. Now the real work begins. The first thing we want to do is blindfold them because as soon as their eyes are covered, their visual uh, awareness of us is gone and they basically go limp. And that seems so important for minimizing the stress. And the way we infer that is because they stop struggling. With precision, they untangle the net, take samples and record health information. The critical GPS radio collar is clamped on. The pronghorn is weighed. 
in a matter of six to eight minutes, it's off and running. We've been catching about 25 a day and we're putting on 50 collars and so we're usually done in two days. The biggest challenge is the weather, which we can't control. The animals themselves tend to be pretty good uh, players in this. Easy for me to say because I'm not a pronghorn. Survival of the Teton pronghorn is directly linked to their ability to return to the park. Like the successful resurgence of the bison, it's hoped that protecting the migration corridor will keep around for generations to come an animal that's been evolving in North America for 40 million years. And in the process, preserve the incredible diversity of wild lands and wildlife that make Grand Teton National Park and the greater Yellowstone region an extraordinary place on this planet. In southern Arizona, Saguaro National Park protects part of the Sonoran Desert, a region of mountainous ranges with seas of green in between. It's one of the luscious deserts on the planet. We get, on average, about 12 inches of rainfall every year. So it's just at the edge of not being a desert. It might be considered more of a thorn forest. A thorn forest that gets its name from the saguaro cactus. These enormous cacti blossom in spring and summer, along with a rich variety of other cacti and plant life. A closer look at the kaleidoscope of color reveals a hidden world that revolves around over 1,000 species of bees, one of nature's largest concentrations. In the wild, bees nest in a variety of habitats, from under the ground, to under rocks, to rock crevices. The park works to avoid visitor bee conflicts, During peak season, park biologist Mark Holden suits up to investigate reports of activity near the more visited areas. Well, this is a colony that we've known about for a couple of years. It's pretty close to um, that parking lot for the trailhead. They're honeybees, but they're actually, I've gotten this close to other colonies before, and had them act more aggressively, but bees seem to know I'm here. Um, but they're not being very aggressive. People could probably walk back and forth in the wash without disturbing this colony. So even if they were a little bit more aggressive, we probably would just leave it alone. Left undisturbed, bees are critical to the diversity of this desert landscape. At the center of it all, it's a pollination partnership. The bee is drawn to the flower by the nectar that the, the plant is producing, the nectar and the pollen. And the nectar is a reward to the bee for coming to that flower, visiting, and then going on to the next flower to look for more nectar. In that process, the bee picks up pollen on its body, on the hairs on its body, and transfers it to the next flower. And that's called cross-pollination. Of the multitude of species of bees, some are solitary, while others, like the Sonoran bumblebee and honeybees, use their nectar to feed an entire colony. A colony that runs like a machine. There's three different castes of bees in the colony. There's the queen. She's thought to control the whole colony. Well, actually, it's, it's chemicals that control the colony, chemical communications. She's just an egg-laying machine. During this time of year, in the spring, she'll lay up to 2,000 eggs a day. Then there's the drones, the males. They don't do any work. Their only job is to go off on mating flights with other queen bees. It's a nice job if you can get it. But the unfortunate thing is they die after they mate. Worker bees, true to their title, do everything. They do the guarding. They do the nursing. They raise the young. There's even a group of bees called the undertaker bees that take out the sick and the dead bees in the colony. A typical worker emerges from her cell, goes
goes to hive cleaning duties, eventually may build wax, move on to the guard duty at the entrance, and eventually go into the field. A cross-section of a bee colony shows what bees protect. So what we've got here is honey on the outside here, and that's their, their carbohydrate source. These are the baby bees in pupa right here. Under these cells, we're going to see pupa bees. Looks like an adult bee, just kind of white. It's still not fully developed. Every one of these pupa was a larva at one point, and that larva had to be fed up to 250 times a day, getting incremental feedings that helped it grow at a rate of 300% increase per day. They give them a little bit of honey, a little bit of pollen, and a little bit of uh, water mixed together in that honey to make a what they call bee bread. Honeybees are the species you're most likely to see buzzing about even though they're not native to the area. In the 1990s, colonies of Africanized honeybees, also called killer bees, moved into the park. European bees differ from African bees in that uh, European bees have been selected for over 2,000 years. Uh, back in the time of the Romans, uh, they had beekeepers on their farms who would take the gentle colonies and replicate them by replicating the gentle ones this way and selection throughout Europe for 2,000 years, we now have very gentle, very domesticated bees. Whereas in Africa, just the other selection has been going on. Every animal that wanted protein would go to those bees trying to steal the brood. Bears and other animals that are after beehives aren't after the honey, they're after the baby bees. The gentle bees were killed off by these, by these predators. Only the most aggressive survived. In the wild, it's difficult to distinguish an aggressive Africanized honeybee from a European honeybee. This is one of our traps that we've got to try and keep bee colonies from setting up in the, uh, in the facilities. And this one's definitely got bees in it. They're definitely honeybees. This is a fairly aggressive colony, so we'll probably have to come out and take care of this one at some point. I don't know if you can hear it or not. They're actually um, mobbing my hood pretty aggressively. So this is the kind of thing, imagine if, if I didn't have a bee suit on, if I didn't have this hood on and I was a park visitor. Ow! <laughs> I just got stung on the chin. I'm gonna take off. Killer bees don't have more venom in their sting, but they're incredibly aggressive when defending their colony. It's scary, and you just basically, you need to get away and get away as fast, as, as quickly as you can. If you're out enjoying Saguaro National Park in full bloom, remember, bees aren't aggressive when they're out foraging for food or water. And the good they do far outweighs the fear factor. Because bees pollinate such a variety of plants, they're regarded as a keystone species of the desert. If we didn't have the bees, the desert would probably look a lot different. Wild National Parks travels to the Everglades, where fresh and salt water merge to create the largest subtropical wilderness in the continental U.S a refuge of sprawling sawgrass prairies, cypress swamps, mangroves, and coastal waters extending off the tip of southern Florida. What makes this system so unique is the assemblage of species that are here because where we sit on the latitude that we're at, I mean, we get a lot of the temperate animals, in other words, the ones that in North America you're always used to, and we get the more tropical species like sea turtles and dolphins and things like that. So it's kind of where these two systems kind of overlap. That's what really makes this place very unique. We've got 
two crocodilians. I mean, we've got alligators and we've got the North American crocodile. And there are very few of them, and Everglades National Park happens to be one of the strongholds. With an area of over one and a half million acres to cover, park biologists watch over a variety of species that include the alligator and the endangered crocodile. This is a better area there, right? Okay. Along with these top predators, the park also studies the migration patterns of one gentle giant, the whiskery-faced West Indian manatee. Manatees are marine mammals, and they're huge. When we say they're sea cows, they, we really mean they're huge. They're huge like a cow, and they're very slow moving when you see them in the water. These mammals that can weigh in at over a ton forage for food in the murky waters along the coastal mangroves. They're adventurers. Using their large paddle-like tails, they can travel over 30 miles per day. We'll see an animal that has a radio tag on it, make a long distance movement over just the course of a day or two, spend a little bit of time, maybe just uh, a couple of days, maybe a week or so in an area, and then turn around and go right back. And we really have no idea why it did that. And sometimes they get in trouble. Trouble is exactly what veterinarians, biologists, and rangers had to contend with when one manatee wound up in a 19th century fortress smack dab in the middle of another national park. Fort Jefferson is the centerpiece of Dry Tortugas National Park, some 70 miles west of Key West, Florida. It's not something we see every day, uh, a manatee here out at Fort Jeff. Um, basically, it caught us all by surprise, and it just wound up inside the moat. The manatee, nicknamed Jefferson after the old fort, was definitely out of its element. The animal looked especially thin, um, and that's not surprising. There are seagrasses there, but it's not the best of, of habitat. But they also need to have access to, to fresh water. Jefferson figured out a way to make do in the middle of the sea. He found fresh water from a culvert that empties into the moat, but he was too stressed out to eat. We knew that manatees eat lettuce and all, so we kept throwing lettuce at it and all, but it wouldn't eat. It just, uh, I, I'm pretty sure it was just totally stressed. Jefferson was going nowhere fast. A rescue team made plans to get him out of the park. But the team faced a major hurdle. It was hurricane season. Jefferson was probably displaced by a storm. So if another storm came, I mean, the dry tortugas are out there in open ocean. If another storm came and he was displaced again, who knows where he would end up. The region had already weathered Hurricane Katrina. Heavy winds from Rita were on the rise. The rescue would have to wait. But would Jefferson survive the storm? This moat wall serves a purpose, and what it does, the storm surge hits this moat wall, the storm surge stops here and splashes up against the fort. He hunkered down at that moat. He was probably in that moat, protected by Fort Jefferson, and for us, a perfect area just to go and scoop him up. Jefferson was rushed from Dry Tortugas National Park to the Sequarium in Miami, where he was not alone. First thing he got to see when he arrived at Miami Sea Quarium was other manatees. We put him in a pool immediately with other males and they all started communicating and he began to eat right away. While daily shows dazzled visitors with the feats of the local marine life, behind the scenes, a team of vets and volunteers run a rehab facility for manatees. Unlike Jefferson, who was stranded, most of the manatees being treated here are recovering from speedboat strikes. Our waters are full of tannins from the, uh, from the mangroves. Often sediments are stirred up. So it's very muddy, very murky, uh, very dark water. Um, so it's very difficult to see uh, an animal. Manatees can see and hear a boat coming, but these slow-moving creatures are wounded when diving down to get out of the way. Everglades and the network of South Florida National Parks and Refuges impose speed limits within their boundaries, but it's not enough of an area for the free-ranging manatee. At the Sequarium, the ones that survive the hit-and-runs get medical attention. 
they don't just come out of the water. So we actually have to drop the water to take blood, mm -hmm. to do any diagnostic work. Everything has to go down to the bottom of the pool to work on them. Among their many success stories, one recovering manatee delivered twins in captivity. Staff and volunteers care for the babies by hand. It's a 24-7 job, but everyone shares a common goal, to return the manatees to the wild. Today, it's Jefferson's turn. After five months of TLC, he's put on 400 pounds. He's ready to be released, along with another rescued manatee called Capri. Safely moving an 1,100-pound animal is a Herculean task. First, the holding tank is partially drained. Carefully, the manatees are moved into a cargo container. When all is secured, a construction crane hoists each manatee up and out. An interagency release team, headed by Florida Fish and Wildlife, places them in the back of a truck. Off they go to a mangrove stronghold not far from the western border of Everglades National Park. The really neat thing, though, is when you get a manatee like Jefferson, that lets people see the individual. A lot of people, you know, they sometimes can't relate to a, a whole population, but to an individual like Jefferson, he's been through so much. You know, he's been through quite an ordeal, and here all these people have gone together to make sure he goes back out and, and is part of the population again. Look out. <laughs> For both Jefferson and Capri, today is a new beginning. America's parklands are vast and mostly untamed. Where the rich diversity of wildlife defines the wilderness. As a modern world begins to close in, the National Park Service takes extreme care to protect the delicate balance so that people can hear the rattle of a rattler that'll stop you dead in your tracks. See pronghorns sprint across a valley, or walk in the presence of a powerful creature. Amid predators and their prey, and harsh and at times inhospitable surroundings, survival in the wild is never a given. These animals that struggle against all odds to perpetuate a life cycle over seasons and centuries deserve our ultimate awe and respect.